Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Today I'd like to talk about wealth management in the sense of private banking, serving private clients, and what I want to talk about when everybody talks about the digitalization of banking, nobody talks about the automatization. The guy before me from McKinsey talked about a little bit of industrialization in a way, straight through processing, more efficient back offices. But what is crucial in order to gain agility towards clients, reactivity, is that your systems need to automatize your processes. Without automatization, and you would stay on the old processes in, let me say, in advisory, in portfolio management, you never gain the speed, you can never deal with the amount of interaction now you're facing with clients who now digitally talk to you. That's why my core topic is how do we automatize what is behind the digital interfaces? And then I talk a little bit about how you adapt the digital interfaces to different clients, different segments, different channels. And for the wealth management area, um, I talk how this goes to one core philosophy of portfolio management that can be to a certain degree highly automatized and improve the efficiency of a bank and make it ready for the automation. That's why what I'm going to talk about is in this automatization, what is the core offering of the bank, what do you need to automatize actually, how does automation place then into the, your different channels, be it a digital channel where clients are self-directed acting. I don't like the term robo-advice too much. Um, I think it's more self-advice, where actually the, di the digitalization digitizes the workbench of the advisory, who still then talks to the clients, but digitally supported. Um, and what type of advice clients are expecting? Are you talking about traditional advice? Do you talk about actual what I call validation, that somebody has actually a trading idea, a portfolio idea, and wants to talk to his private banker to validate the idea? Or are we talking about crash, traditional discretionary mandates, which is delegation? And last but not least, I'd like to talk about the components you need for this digital wealth management in which type of architecture this ends. And the speaker before me basically set the scene because he said we are sitting on very old system and we need a unique new platform that actually supports an interactive and agile client interaction. And that's why I believe we need this three-layer architecture where you sit on the more or less old data layer, your old core banking, then build the service and business layer on top of it, which is fully detached from the old stuff, and on that you have a presentation layer that is different per channel, meaning self, the self channel, the client advisor channel, or different between uh, market segments if you have retail clients or you're talking about true private clients. So that's why in order to set the scene, what type of two offers you offer as a bank to your clients? On, on, on the right-hand side, um, we have what is typically offered in execution only or in traditional e-banking services or pure e-banking providers, which I call as a product supermarket in the trade executions. Client know actually what to buy, the digital offer gives you access to different products, different funds, structured products, maybe even more advanced stuff where you customize your products, like what the structured product industry does, but it provides very little advice. It's all about self-directed. Um, and on the left-hand side, you have the traditional mission of a bank. The mission of a bank, in my view, is not just to provide you the ingredients and you can cook yourself, but actually to serve you a ready-made dish. Because most people don't understand extremely well the products, they don't understand portfolio and diversification aspects, and that's why they need actually the private banker or the portfolio manager that takes the ingredients and cooks a nice dish, actually the portfolio. The portfolio management and portfolio construction is the, I believe, is the true reason um, why a private bank or wealth management organization exists. It needs to take in, of course, all the products, and it needs to take in the best products available, that's why from the other question we heard today, I believe very much in this open platform and the best in class approaches because it's the only way to go forward. And if you do this, this portfolio management 
and you offer this to the client, it all comes down to actually two dimensions, risk and return. So you need to digitalize how you measure risk, how you measure your opportunity, and how you build from your measurement of opportunities um, a good portfolio. And what is really important is nobody has this crystal ball. So I don't know what the SMI is doing tomorrow. I have no clue. Um, but your organization has so much knowledge inside. You have your strategies, your best product lists, your research. And this needs to, to combine it in. And from that, we need to basically imply what is the expectation of the organization. Because nobody has a consistent expectation model going forward that consistently will, be, will beat the market. And that's why in order to automatize wealth management offering, I believe you need to automatize the three main pillars um, that form your portfolio construction. And that's why I believe you need to invest heavily in correct risk measurement. Clients want to be updated what's going on. This is also a great way of communication. If something has happened, you can inform the client, you send him a message. This can be in discretionary, this can be in advice. You say what is quantitatively happening and you give a reason to it. The other thing is you need to talk to the clients about the opportunities and at best you, you, you take the opportunities and and take in the wisdom of your organization. So by taking in what your chief investment officer does in forming SAAs, possible TAAs, your product people in forming the best list, you can, we can actually take in this data and imply the organizational view on the market. So because if your organization overweights US equities over European equity, of course you have a higher expectation on US equities than in European equity, so on and so forth. So in this way, you don't need actually by a bunch of analysts or different systems to really predict what's going on. Your actual way of how you've, you build your strategies, how you build your product offering implies what you expect in the future. And this can be systematically taken on and can be pushed towards um, the systems that show then what is the expectation of our organization on your portfolio and our strategy. And last but not least, I believe it's, it's the crucial element for automatization is a portfolio construction. You need to steer your clients towards your strategy. You need to take in preferences and restrictions of clients. It's essential that you don't, even in discretionary mandate, give everybody the same dish, but somebody likes, in, in, in that word, a different appetizer or a different dessert. So people have clear restrictions. They have made bad experiences with companies, with markets. They have clear preferences because they believe, for example, in growth in Asia. They believe in a US story. So you have to take this in. And even though the strategies, your products list, come from the back, are industrialized, by having in this automatized portfolio construction, you can take in clients' preferences. Um, and that's why this, this main element of the advisory process that we from SwissCon automatize and digitalize is the first element is client need to understand what's going on. They need to be actually educated. What does risk mean? What does opportunity mean? What are the limits what a bank can provide in its advice? Um, then, you need to assess where you are with your portfolio, show the gap in terms of risk return, diversifications, and then steer the portfolio towards the target allocation and respect client-specific constraint, respect all the new regulation, make sure that you only sell instruments to the client he understands, make sure that the risk levels are respected so you take into account everything that is going under the MIFID regulation, the stuff that is going on in Singapore or the upcoming FITLEC um, in Switzerland. And this is the core at the heart of automatization um, in digitalization of wealth management. Today, if you look at the market of the fintechs, there are two types, or I've given three examples. So there's the traditional example of Swissquote, which is a product supermarket, and the new startups in fintech that make a lot of media attention are actually going for this portfolio management hub. This is, I picked Wells Front and Nutmeg. There's so many now, um, I cannot write you down in, in an excessive list. And Nutmeg and Wells Front concentrate on portfolio management, on simple ETF portfolios. They concentrate also giving you restriction and preferences. Um, 
Nutmeg being the largest in the UK, for example, includes in all that compliance to the new MIFID suitability and appropriateness rules. Um, and this is where the bank is under attack. I'm not sure if they will be as big as the banks because there is still this problem of clients not understanding financial instruments, client not understanding diversification and other issues, and that's why they still want to talk to their private banker. Nonetheless, you may have clients who understand more. They do something in the funny money accounts, which they would do self-directed, and they have other things where they actually need support from the client advisor. And that's why we believe that for wealth management, we have two types of general offers in the, in, in, in the type of um, services. There is one type, which is the self-directed. Um, and the other type is client advisor supported. So if we talk about digitalization, when we have advice seeking or validation seeking at the, at the client advisor level, the client advisor gets equipped with an iPad, equipped with the same with a system for risk, return, recommendation, analysis of the portfolio, but his job is the relationship management to the client, understanding the need and being the translator. Whereas the system does most of the portfolio management allocation, makes sales and buy recommendations. In validation, if a client comes on, they have this or that type and there's a one-to-one -one talk, the system validates the trade, is this a good instrument, do we support this instrument, what happens to your portfolio, what happens to the risk return dimensions. Self-directed, you can use the same system with more limited instruments, with more safety guards, with more bounds, and the clients can use the system and get advice from the bank in a digital form. I still, this is a minority because it needs a lot better educated client. The same on advice seeking. If I have if a validation seeking, if I have, I have a trading idea, I can enter in the system, I could see pre-trade, what happens to risk, return, are this on the recommendation list? Are this the themes we are supporting as the bank? And last but not least, you have delegation mandates, discretionary mandates. They actually can be designed regardless of the channel. Mandates are nothing but the best sort of dish the bank can cook, and you can serve this in the traditional way, where you explain the mandate for the, from the client advisor using possibly an iPad, or it can be put into your traditional e-banking, but with the difference that I believe we need more notification, we need more interaction in a sense that you show what happens in risk, you show what happens why you sold or bought an instrument, you show what happened why your research thinks this instrument is better than that one. So in this way, um, the mandates can be, I believe, classically still designed, but need a new communication way. And when we distinguish between Wealth management, the really rich and, and retailer, affluent client, the difference is only how you parameterize the system. So in advice seeking, you, you offer to private retail clients the whole thing with reduced complexity, fewer products, but you still use the same engine. Whereas in wealth management, you, you give the full complexity and the full um, possibility to the client advisor. The same on validation seeking. You, 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 support fewer products, you support fewer analysis in the, in the retail space than you actually um, do in the wealth management space. But I believe in this middle layer above your data, you need the same engine and the same system that supports one philosophy that comes in many variations um, to the clients in the presentation layers. I will skip this for the sake of time. Um, and go to the components and the architecture of an advice system. I really believe that in order to be adapted to clients, your client segments, on the presentation layer, you need to be different in Switzerland than in Asia or in the US. Your presentation layer needs to be different if you talk to retail or you talk to wealth management, and the presentation layer is different if the user of the presentation layer is the client advisor or is a self-directed the client in the e-banking um, behind the presentation layer where you can um, actually customize this to the different channels and segments very precisely to the different countries, the different cultures. You need one, I believe, portfolio advice engine that brings one consistency to all the channels and segments, to your client advisor and your clients, which basically gathers the entire wisdom of the company, is extremely agile, 
reacts extremely fast, is, is calculating at speed, so you have the same experience as in any other tools. If you swipe somewhere, you get immediately a result. If you do today's portfolio management system, you want to calculate something, you can wait for the next end of day job. This is totally unacceptable in, in a digital world. If you want to say, buy this, sell this, how does this look like? It needs to instantaneously bring the result to the presentation layer. And you need to set this on your data, global sources, and some of the data layer and global sources are always the same. Some stuff is specific by rules from regulation that are core banking, country specific, other stuff is always the same. So that's why when you build such a system, I believe you have reusable global data, such for example your strategies, your CIO data, your product data, and it doesn't make sense you have a different product um, database running in Switzerland than in Singapore in the US, you actually need one global master for this type of data. You have other stuff like client data that is, is local or booking center specific, certain bank data also f to keep um, confidentiality, and other data like tax, tax data or rules and regulatory data can be used globally and then feed in the same middle tier that actually does provide you the business services, that helps you to master the upcoming tsunami in, in, in private banking regulation and suitability and appropriateness, actually helps to steer you the portfolios, um, does the health checks of the portfolio shows the past performance, and this stuff is the middle tier that goes below the presentation layer um, and ensures that you have one consistent, automatized, highly efficient approach that helps to really bring the automatization into your new digital world. So the, the same picture, a bit more in graphics. As I said before, important is that your presentation layer is really localized, channel specific, very flexible. On this, you need to play, you need to see how your clients act, to the way you talk to them, how you present information, how the interaction goes. And behind that, for your core offering in portfolio advice, you have this one middle platform that sits then on your data sources. And this often needs to build totally anew. This, you can use old stuff. Some of the databases need to be more agile and flexible. But this stuff is where you really need to invest. And this is the stuff where I believe you have to be more playful. Because this is the only way to really get the new generation in and make it exciting as my um, as the other speaker before me from Credit Suisse said. So, and I skip this. So that's why I want to, to conclude. The investment process and the front ends, I believe, are really specific. Um, and in this way, it's also an opportunity from banks because everybody says the party is over. You can clearly more separate channels and clients and be more. Um, be more profitable because you address for each segment and channel directly to its need and can maximize revenue. I don't believe that the party is really over. For that, I'm too young. Um, methodology, data structures, I think should be shared across segments. And what I believe strongly is that you need this business intelligence layer that does the data analysis, that calculates the business services for the core offering is in the middle. And adapting this whole thing can be done by parametrization. So you don't need a different business layer if you're in Singapore and Switzerland. I think you adapt this by different strategies, different products, different safety belts, different health checks. And and the good story about banking is one of, I believe, still the least efficient industry. If we go down this route, I think we get a lot more efficient. I think by having the middle tier layer that is parametrizable, independent of location, that we build on top of the global data sources, I think this is also a way to increase the efficiency in banking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Herzog. We still have a couple of minutes for one or two questions before we have a coffee break. Um, I was wondering, you have been talking a lot about wealth management. How and how far can we apply your insights also to the asset management industry? Are there differences or how are your experiences on that field? 
in the asset management industry, I think we, we get into a similar game, only with the difference that instead of everybody installing its Barra tools and its portfolio management tools, this will move to the cloud. Because certain things, you're not making the performance because your value at risk reporting engine is better than your competitors. You make a great performance because you have better strategies and better insight. A lot of things that are today software is commodity and I will believe moves into a cloud um, and, and be supported then, for example, by the best data provider behind it. And you're not then sitting on one piece of software, integrate some data. So this middle tier story for the banks that sit on top of the different booking center for asset management, I believe are cloud solutions, for example, in the analytical space or cloud solution on the data support space. Is there any question in the room about automation? <laughs> yes, there is or is it one. Yes. Hi, Florian. Hello. You're doing well. <laughs> I have a tricky question for you. You plot this on the efficient frontier, your target portfolio. I assume you apply the minimum risk um, port, uh, portfolio. I don't know if this is possible, but before we heard, we still should look for alpha, which then you should have plotted your target portfolio above the efficient frontier. So who's wrong or right? Oh, I, neither. <laughs> neither, because... Um, First of all, this is just an illustration to make it easy. Second of all, is I, I, I think you have this target portfolio, and this target portfolio doesn't need to be only on the asset allocation level, but on the instrument level. And by picking instruments in your best list, you indirectly assign alpha to it. If alpha, really, alpha generation is possible, being a statistician, I'm a bit skeptical. <laughs> Okay, I think we, we will still have some time to discuss in our uh, little panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Herzog. Thank you. Thank you.